So to pick up where we left off uh, from Wednesday, we were continuing our discussion about multi-electron systems, and we had gotten up to the point where uh, we described the Pauli principle. And remember that the Pauli exclusion principle, uh, that concept from general chemistry, is a special consequence of this much more general physical uh, principle. And so the Pauli principle tells us that for two fermions, two identical fermions, a uh, detail I didn't mention yesterday, uh, the sign of the wave function has to change whenever I interchange or exchange the particle labels. So in this case, we say that fermions have an anti-symmetric wave function with respect to exchange, while bosons, this other type of particle that we've uh, just barely mentioned a few times, bosons are symmetric. If I interchange two bosons, then it turns out the wave function doesn't pick up a sign. Uh, so starting from this kind of uh, analysis, what we would like to do is enforce the anti-symmetry principle uh, on top of our wave function. Uh, yes, we have a question. Um, since I, I noticed that uh, you have the uh, like electrons or an example of the fermion, is there like an, like an example for like the boson is, is that like a proton or a neutron? Protons and neutrons are not bosons, to be perfectly clear. A proton is a fermion, and so is a neutron, it turns out. Uh, the example of bosons that we've seen in this class just very briefly is a photon. So the packet of light uh, energy that we think about uh, is actually a boson. Uh, but beyond that, we haven't had a chance to talk about, and we won't talk about any other examples. All right, so from this uh, description of uh, the Pauli principle, we should enforce this symmetry, this anti-symmetry, on top of our wave function in order to uh, obey the Pauli principle. Uh, so we took a little aside with the homework problem at the end of Wednesday, and I just want to remind you that when you're evaluating integrals like this one, it works exactly like the homeworks we've seen in previous weeks, where you'll need to expand d tau in terms of the spherical harmonics, I'm sorry, the 3D spherical definition, r squared, sine theta, dr, d theta, d phi. And then you have to do the integral exactly like we've seen before as well. So this part of the problem is exactly the same as what we've done in previous weeks, except that we're generalizing uh, for a uh, nuclear charge not equal to one. But with that said, I'd like to continue on with this discussion of the wave function and tie back into the Pauli principle and wrap up uh, by connecting it to, uh, sorry, let me get it all straight here, uh, connecting it to uh, Slater determinants, this type of wave function uh, that naturally enforces the Pauli principle. So uh, just to be clear, the original wave function we started with was a Hartree product. Let me make sure my Jamboard is gonna load because I'm writing and it doesn't appear to be uh, showing up. I see we wrote on the 12th slide. I agree. Uh, thank you for catching that. Uh, we'll get to the 12th slide in a second. Let's start at 11. <laughs> uh, Hartree. All right, so the wave function that we started with was just a product of wave functions. We had the 1s wave function for particle one times the 1s spatial wave function for particle two times the spin up wave function for particle one and the spin down wave function for particle two. So keep in mind that right now, what we've just constructed uh, is the Hartree product for this 1s2 configuration for helium, for example, right? Just to make sure we're all on the same page uh, in terms of the system that we're working with. The Hartree product is symmetric under exchange. And what does that really mean? It means that nothing changes uh, if I swap particles one and two. 
uh, in this case, uh, I'm just basically exchanging the labels, ones and twos. I'm sorry, this should have been a two, not a one. I'm exchanging the particle labels and I get back the exact same function. Uh, it's basically just the spatial 1s part times uh, this product of spin functions. So to enforce the anti-symmetry or the Pauli principle, really, right? This is the same thing as the Pauli principle. Uh, we need to use these wave functions that are built from an object called the determinant. And it turns out that this uh, chemist, Slater, was the uh, chemist who popularized this approach and really recognized this deficiency with the Hartree product. So this would have been uh, the early 1920s, uh, 1930s. Uh, here we are. So we've got Slater determinants. Let me see some reactions. Have you heard of this word in any other context? I see a couple people that have heard of a determinant. I guarantee you, you have, even if it wasn't necessarily called that. Uh, so it turns out this determinant is uh, the object, uh, for instance, where I take four things in a 2D representation. Let's do the following. The determinant is written with this kind of like magnitude symbols. And then it's like we take the uh, products of certain things inside of this and subtract them. So the determinant for this particular setup is A times D minus C times B. So let me check in again. Have you seen this concept before loosely at all in any mathematics or physics class? Yes, you absolutely have. And so now what I'm uh, trying to convince you of is that this concept, the determinant, is a very general mathematical concept. And it naturally enforces uh, this anti-symmetry due to the following relationships. If I interchange any two columns inside of a determinant, turns out I get a minus sign. Do you see what I did? I swapped the first column for the second column, and it turns out the determinants of those two constructions are related by a minus sign. And that's exactly what we need for the anti-symmetry. Uh, it also turns out if we swap uh, two rows, uh, then we can uh, get a minus sign as well. So for instance, if I had A, B, C, D, that's the same as minus C, D, A, B. So because the determinant naturally has these anti-symmetric properties under uh, exchange or permutations of the columns and rows, if we build a wave function using a determinant, then it will naturally enforce the Pauli principle. So ultimately, uh, these determinants naturally enforce this Pauli principle. So let's write down the general formula for how to build the Slater determinant uh, from a given set of orbitals. So imagine with me for a second that instead of just having two electrons, I take n electrons, right? So that's just some number, n is an integer. That could be, you know, two if I'm talking about helium, or it could be three if I'm talking about lithium, etc. So I'm going to take these n electrons and put them in n orbitals. Right, So those two numbers have to be the same. Uh, I have to have as many orbitals as I have electrons. And hopefully that makes sense from general chemistry as well. Right, I need to have a seat on the bus for every person that's trying to take a ride. So in this case, uh, I need to use these uh, 
electrons and wave functions to build up the determinant. I see I've missed some questions in the chat, but I'm not sure at uh, what point they came along. Uh, so maybe we can catch those up at the end. So to build the wave function, psi, for these n electrons, remember that each particle gets a little seat in my function. I'm gonna be setting that equal to one over square root of n factorial times a big determinant. And that determinant is gonna have the one electron orbitals on the rows and the electrons on the columns, all right? So this notation is a little tricky. I apologize, that should not be a two, that should be a one. So we're basically building up a big square matrix that goes inside a determinant. That's uh, one of the requirements here. So I take these n orbitals and I fill them up into this description and out comes a naturally anti-symmetric wave function. Now that's a big equation to chew on. And my guess is that a uh, few of you have ever seen a determinant for more than two or three uh, entries, like a two by two or a three by three. Uh, I am not expecting us to learn about the general formula to evaluate this. Uh, it turns out that you can ask Mathematica to do it, right? Mathematica has a determinant function. It turns out it's DET. And if you give it a list of lists, it'll give you back exactly what you think. So for instance, the determinant of what I've just written out, if you punch that in Mathematica, it will give me back A times D minus B times C. So uh, you don't have to learn how to evaluate the determinant in general. Uh, you just need to be able to recognize the construction. So this is the general idea. But let's apply to two electrons. so that we can see what happens uh, for the Slater determinant in comparison to the Hartree product. That's ultimately the comparison we wanna make today. So to apply this for two electrons, let me just do a reality check. Throw it in the chat. If I have two electrons, how many orbitals do I need in order to build the determinant? If we had n electrons up here, we're saying n is equal to two, and we have to put them in the same number of orbitals. So in this case, we need two orbitals. And that's exactly what we have already been working with. Keep in mind that the 1s up and the 1s down functions, right? Those are two different orbitals. Uh, so let's build the Slater determinant uh, for two electrons in this configuration. So our wave function, uh, I'm going to write this as psi sd for Slater determinant, is a function of r1 and r2, because we only have two electrons. We're going to have a factor, 1 over square root, 2 factorial, but it turns out 2 factorial is just 2. So I've got 1 over square root 2, and now I want to build up the determinant. I'm using the two orbitals as follows, 1 0, 0, Oops, sorry, that should be a beta, not an alpha. Talking about the down spin for the second orbital. All right, so we'll give these little labels, phi one and phi two. All right, phi one means this orbital and phi two means this orbital. So now I'm gonna look for some volunteers. Noah, what's my first entry? How do I write the first entry in this determinant? Uh, 
Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, the first entry would be psi of one alpha. I agree. And so to write that in this language, I have phi one, that's the orbital. Right. And then I use the coordinates for particle one. Definitely. Does okay. everybody follow that notation? I made a little switch when we did this a second ago. Sorry, I didn't realize that was just phi. That's okay. Uh, but I think you communicated the correct idea, which is what we need. Uh, let me look for a different volunteer. Uh, let's see. Who else is here today? Thanks for sticking around, by the way. Uh, Josh, can you help me out? What should be in this entry? Is the orbital the same? Uh, yeah, it should be oh. phi 1 r2. There it is, phi 1 of r2. It's the same orbital. Remember that the rows are the orbitals, and the column is the particle label. Uh, thank you, folks. Casey, can you help me out? What's this third entry here? What are the labels I need down here? It should be phi 2 r1. Perfect. And then I need, oh, the last one. Uh, Kira, can you help me out? What's going to go for this fourth entry? Um, phi 2 r2. Perfect. Thanks so much. All right, so if, I, uh, if I'm doing this construction, right, this is the, the way it would look. And then we can apply it to get out the, the final wave function, right? So if I expand the determinant, I'm going to get 1 over square root 2. Remember, it's these two things tied together minus these two things tied together. Wow, there we go. All right, so I'm going to have phi 1 of r1 times phi 2 of r2 minus phi 1 of r2 times phi 2 of r1. Now, it absolutely doesn't matter if you wrote this as phi 2 r1 times phi 1 r2, right? These two things are totally equivalent because it's just multiplication, right? We're just multiplying two functions together, so it doesn't matter the order that you write them in. When we think about operators, operators really do matter the order they come in. But for these functions, we can interchange them. Let me check for questions so far. Are we clear to this point? If we were having a like a larger particle system, we'd have to define them as something other than alpha and beta, right? No, there are always only two spins, up and down. But we would need different spatial wave functions. So for instance, if we talked about lithium, we would need a 2s orbital to describe the valence. Does that sound okay. familiar? Yes, yes. Excellent. Any other questions? We've got about 10 minutes left, and uh, we are nearing the end of this discussion, so I think we'll be able to finish in time. All right, so I just want to expand out this definition uh, so that we can do a little factoring. If I plug in the definitions of these phi functions, then we'll achieve the following wave function. So all I'm doing right now, folks, is plugging in the definition for the phi's. 1, 0, 0, R1 times alpha 1. And then we've got psi 1, 0, 0, R2 times beta 2, right? This is the first term. And we're subtracting from that psi 1, 0, 0, R2 times alpha 2 times psi 1, 0, 0, R1, beta 1. Up and down are two different orbitals because of the two different spin functions. If the spin functions were the same, we wouldn't have to have this conversation. But because the up and down electrons have different spin functions, then the orbital is different for each of those electrons. But if you're looking down here at this thing we just wrote out, are there any terms that I can factor? What could I pull out from this subtraction? Psi one zero zero. Of 
R1 both, and R2. Yeah, there we go. Of both particles. Thank you. The spatial part of this wave function is the same in both terms. It's a 1s orbital uh, for both electrons. And so that means I can factor out the spatial part and have it as space times spin, right? The total wave function can be represented as a spatial part times the spin part for two electrons, but that is not true for more than two electrons. So this is really a special case for the helium atom or for any two electron uh, system, I should say. So we've got one over square root two, and then we have psi one zero zero r one times psi one zero zero r two. And now look at what's left over. Have you seen this function in your homework? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I've written it in so many ways. I keep forgetting how to do that. Uh, I'm going to keep the alpha the same. There we go. All right. This whole thing here, and I'll give you a hint. It turns out the normalization constant you're hunting for in homework uh, 11, number three, right, is one over square root two. But you have to show all the mathematics to get there in part B. Uh, I'm just letting you know ahead of time, the correct answer should be one over square root of two. So for this Slater determinant of two electrons, we end up with this very beautiful product of functions. We have the spatial wave function, which is just a product of the 1s orbitals for each electron times this singlet spin function. And uh, this is really this important concept, right? So this thing is the singlet spin function, eigenfunction. for two electrons. And that's exactly what I'm asking you to explore uh, in your homework. So spoiler alert, it's an eigenfunction for this stuff down here. That's what you should find, all right? And if you don't find that, then that likely means you've made a small mistake and I'm happy to help you get back on track. Uh, so as you're working through the last parts of number three and homework 11, you should be able to find that this function sigma minus, the singlet spin eigenfunction, is an eigenfunction of S1 squared, also for S2 squared. Remember that these are the total spin for particles one and particle two. And then if I add them to get the total spin of the two electron system, I should also find that it's an eigenfunction. So I hope that as you're working through these problems, you can tie them back to this uh, discussion that we're having here. Um, but what's really crucially important is that this singlet spin function is anti-symmetric under exchange. Uh, and that's what I'm asking you to prove in your homework. So to do that, to actually show for number uh, 3a, all I'm asking you to do is to take uh, sigma minus and exchange the labels. So you would write down sigma minus for two, one, and see how that is related to the original function sigma minus one, two, right? That's the proof that I'm asking you to do for homework number 11, 3A. Any quick questions uh, before we wrap up our discussion in the last four to five minutes? All right. Uh, so I think we, what we have just done is arrived at this Slater determinant, which properly enforces the Pauli principle. Um, and so now we want to double check uh, why this is not a possible configuration. All right, so why this is not possible. Think with me for a minute. Is the spatial part of this wave function where I have two up electrons in the 1s orbital, is the spatial part of this wave function the same as the spatial part from what we've done before? Yes. Yes, that's correct. It is. Remember that it's just the 1s orbital. 
So the physical uh, spatial part is exactly the same. The only thing that's different is that we have two up electrons. Uh, so we've got two alpha electrons. So let's make a Slater determinant out of two alpha electrons. Uh, in this case, let's call this sigma up, up. I'm going to have one over square root two. And then I'm going to get alpha one, alpha two, alpha two. Nope, I'm sorry, I did that wrong. What happens when I calculate the determinant for this quantity? Zero. Yep, it's identically equal to zero. I get one over square root two times alpha one, alpha two, minus alpha two, alpha one. And guess what? That's zero. So the Slater determinant naturally eliminates these configurations. And that's why we say the Pauli exclusion principle is a consequence of this analysis. If you look at two electrons in the same box with the same spin, they have the same four quantum numbers. And whenever that's true, the Slater determinant is identically zero for that wave function. So ultimately what we ask you to learn in general chemistry is a consequence of this very high level analysis for fermionic wave functions. But because in chemistry, we're just looking for what it means for us, we can boil that down to the statement that two electrons in an atom cannot have the same four quantum numbers. Personally, I thought that was a really neat connection when I was taking this class. Uh, the fact that you know we can really point specifically to why uh, we've learned all of these rules uh, back in general chemistry. So I think that does conclude us uh, in terms of this discussion. I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but otherwise, you know, we've reached the end of our official time for today. Uh, if you want to see more about what's called the Aufba principle, uh, this has to do with how we fill the electrons in from lowest energy to highest energy. There is a handwritten example uh, inside of our lecture slides uh, in the handwritten notes. So I'll just draw your attention to that here. If you'd like to read about it, I show you why 1s2 is lower in energy than 1s1, 2s2. Lastly, in the handwritten notes, I've got a few summary statements. So I definitely encourage you to check out these handwritten notes as you're studying, uh, just because I've tried to point out some conceptual statements uh, that can help you get all your thoughts in order. Uh, so be looking for these as well as you study for the test next week. I'm going to stop recording and then I think we'll call it for today.